Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to make sure everything is on. OK, fantastic. Are you all excited for the second day of WordCamp Europe? Yeah. Woohoo! Awesome. All right. So as Anne said, I'm going to talk to you about using WordPress for good. And for me, that means working with nonprofit clients. Now, I didn't just wake up one day and decide, hey, I'm going to work with nonprofit clients. What a brilliant idea. So a little bit of a backstory. I come from Montreal in the wonderful, woo, Montreal. All right. Hey, Catherine. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, fun fact about the province of Quebec, where Montreal is located, uh, is that we have a, a vibrant mining industry. So about $7.6 billion of our gross domestic product every year comes from the mining industry. Uh, as no surprise, it should come that a mining industry company came to me one day and was like, hey, you know what? We need some help with our WordPress website. OK, cool. Let's see what we can do. The whole time we were talking about how we can help them and what we can do, I just had this irksome feeling. This client just doesn't feel right. And why doesn't it feel right? Because I really don't want to contribute to this industry. I really don't want my name, my company's name, to be anywhere associated with mining or anything that's that environmentally um, unsafe. So then I started thinking further, OK, what, what does that mean? What is right then? And what I realized was the clients that did feel right were the clients that were doing something good, the clients that were doing something helpful, and they weren't doing it for the sake of a profit. Not for profit, non-profit, OK? The light bulb went off. I'm like, oh, OK, this makes sense. My clients are the non-profits in the world. The second thought I had was, all right, so I guess if I work with nonprofits, I'm going to be happy and fulfilled. But I'm probably going to be broke for the rest of my life. Because that's the, the, the general idea we have about nonprofits, right? Nonprofit, no profit, no money, no budget, broke. Surprisingly, that didn't stop me. I'm a business person. But the profit thing didn't stop me. And I thought, OK, cool. So the reason why I really love these clients is not only because they're doing something good, but because I want to do something good, too. I want to have some meaning from the work that I'm doing. I want to actually leave a positive impact in this world when I'm done and my time is over. The thing that did give me pause, though, was this whole specializing thing. Do we have anyone in the audience who's like, ugh, specializing, that sounds scary? Nobody. All right, we'll go through this a little faster then. Cool. Uh, so it was scary because it felt like saying yes to a really, really small group of people while saying no to a much, much larger one, right? That kind of feels risky from a business standpoint. So let's get into a little exercise just to get you over that. Let's say you just became a parent of a beautiful little baby, maybe two. And you think that your baby is just the best baby out there because it's yours. You made it. And you're so proud of it and you want to share with the world just how awesome your baby is, you hire someone to take some photos. Are you going to hire a landscape photographer? No. Are you going to hire a food photographer? Definitely not. You're going to hire the best dang baby photographer that your money can buy. And that's exactly how your clients feel about their business or organization. Right? It's their baby. They're so proud. And they know it's special because they made it. So from this perspective, you can definitely see how specializing pays off. It pays off because you can actually charge what you're worth. I'm not talking about like gouging nonprofits for money. That's not what we're talking about here. Just what you're worth so that it's fair to you, it's fair to them, right? It's a win-win. Um, you can do better quality work because you're going to be less stressed out. You're getting paid what you're worth. When you do high quality work, you're happy. Clients are more likely to A, stick with you, and B, give you referrals. And those referrals are worth their uh, weight in gold. And when they give you those referrals, the referrals might be nonprofits. They might be something else. That's fine. There's no specialization police. No one's going to come and say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't take that project. It's a not, not a nonprofit, but you work with nonprofits. If you are having a slow quarter, a slow, God forbid, year, you just take that pro project and you go with it. Sounds good, right? High five. So here's the thing. That applies to all specialization. What about nonprofits? Here's a, a fun fact about my personal experience. In the first year of announcing that we are now specializing in working with nonprofits, we goes 3.5 times more than the previous year. Times, not percent, times. Now, there was a little bit of luck involved, 
There's always a little bit of luck involved. Yes, we were undercharging as well, so there's that. But it was also a lot of hard work, and a lot of this. <laughs> so the hard work came from having to break into a new niche, right? A new niche is always difficult to break into, but there's things that you can do to make it a little easier, because obviously you're going to pretty much start off almost from zero, right? You're going to have to rebuild your portfolio to target a new audience, etc. So things you can do, partner up with someone who's already specializing, like maybe an agency that uses a different technology than you are. So for example, let's say it's a Ruby on Rails agency that's working with nonprofits, you do WordPress. Awesome. Uh, another lovely thing about doing this is that when they're too busy, or maybe a project doesn't fit them too well, they're going to send you referrals. Good for business. Um, you can do some pro bono work if you want to. I would kind of really advise you not to do that unless you have resources to do it. So if you have folks on your staff that are uh, under bill uh, hourly, OK, put them on a pro bono project. You can also go for like a smaller pro bono project, not a full-on website, but maybe a one-day hackathon, maybe a small sprint. That'll work. And finally, you're going to have to find out where these folks are hanging out. Right? They're, they're watering holes. And build relationships with people, because relationships is how business actually works. So what do I mean by watering holes? Well, a lot of nonprofits belong to associations. So for example, um, museums. Museums usually belong to a regional or a national association. Those associations are going to have events, conferences, and you can show up and start listening to what the problems are in that particular niche of nonprofits. Um, and start figuring out how you can help them. You can start meeting people, and et cetera, and actually become very valuable to them. A few organizations worth mentioning here. Ooh, which one are you? All right, so Nonprofit Technology Network is my favorite. <laughs> um, whoa, that just got really loud, no? Okay. Uh, <laughs> they're my favorite because they only, not only do they have an online community you can join free of charge, and there's lots and lots of forums. There's one for WordPress. There's one for women in tech. Um, you can find people, like-minded people, people you want to learn from, and start building a network. They also have events. They're based in the States. So if you're in North America, it suits you a lot better. There's also a yearly conference you can go to, and it's kind of like a WordCamp like this. There's just a whole lot of people there that know about technology for nonprofits that are nonprofits. They also have a certification program. So you can actually plop a nice little certification badge on your website, say, hey, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not just saying I specialize in, in nonprofit technology. The rest of these are, are mostly um, for nonprofits, but you want to get into their mindset as much as you can. So you can go there and find out, OK, so what are the technology issues in the nonprofit sector? Um, what, what are they doing with technology? Where can I be helpful? So definitely worth checking out. And all of these things are linked. So in the end, there's going to be a link to the slides. And then you can go and click on all these things from the slides. OK, so this is the question on everyone's minds, right? How do nonprofit budgets work? Well, you're probably thinking that when you ask nonprofits about their budget, you're going to hear something like this. Well, we're a nonprofit, so we don't really have a budget, right? OK, what if you substitute nonprofit for small business? That all of a sudden makes a lot more sense, right? Now, I'm not saying that all nonprofits are small businesses, but there's definitely a nice large number of nonprofits, just like in business and for-profit business, that identify as small organizations or small businesses. So OK, what does that mean? That means that there's actually lots of large nonprofits like Amnesty International or Oxfam, or you know, if you're, plan if you're uh, following the news in the States, Planned Parenthood, ACLU, Doctors Without Borders. Think about all the folks that these people employ and all the salaries that they have to pay. Do you think that when they come to an agency for uh, a website, they say, hey, but you know what? We're a nonprofit. We don't really have a budget. Of course not. These folks are dealing with like million, sometimes billion dollar budgets. So the thing that you need to remember right away is nonprofit doesn't mean no money. It means a business. It's still a business. And yes, just like in for-profit business, nonprofit business can be all sizes, small and large. So don't get discouraged if you get that, well, we're a nonprofit. We don't really have a budget. 
It could be that they're just a small nonprofit. It could be that they have other priorities, and that's fair enough. A few special things about nonprofit budgets. So on an annual basis, they will decide what budget they will allot to the next year. So they will, <clears throat> excuse me, they will look at how fundraising went the year before, and then they will decide, okay, so what can we allot where for the next year? There's also a great degree of transparency because donors want to know where their money is going. So oftentimes, nonprofits will actually have annual reports on their website where you can see, okay, so this is how much they raised and this is uh, where it all went. And oh, communications budget, that's websites. Um, sometimes it's not on their website, but you can usually find it fairly easily. And the thing is, if there's a small budget that you do have to work with, you can always prioritize scope and start planning with them for the future, phase two, phase three, et cetera. And as soon as you start planning with them for the future so that they can plan on their end, their fundraising efforts to make it happen, you become their partner. And that's a pretty good place to find yourself. Of course, we also call them organizations, right? Not businesses. So there's a few considerations to keep in mind. A few familiar questions you should be asking, like, hey, who's going to be maintaining this website? Are they tech savvy? Do they know how to use WordPress? Now you know how much training you're going to have to build in. What's the number one action that folks should take on your website? Uh, with nonprofits, it's usually one of four. Well, it's all four, but you have to prioritize. Donate. Give us your email so we can send you stuff in your email ma mailbox. Follow us on social media so we can show up in your feed and tell you about what we're doing and what we need you to do to help us. And hey, we have a program. Join us. You have to prioritize, because if you have all four of those things screaming at people from every page, that's not going to work. So from the design standpoint, very similar to any other website. And who makes the final decision? Now, if you're used to working with smaller organizations, smaller uh, businesses, you're probably usually talking with the decision maker to begin with. But once you're going a little bit bigger than that, you're probably talking to a communications manager or a marketing manager. And at that point, they have a boss. That boss might have another boss. And oh boy, they might have a board of directors too. And that board of directors and how much they're going to be involved is extremely important. Um, because if you have a 20 people, 20 member board of directors, and they need to be involved in revisions and approvals, you need to know that right away. Because there's going to be a lot more effort from you, a lot more time, a lot more vetting, and, and all these things that you have to do. So at the same time, maybe you don't want to work with someone who has 20 members on the board of directors. That's fair. That's fine. Ask the question. Then there's a few unique questions to ask. What's the turnover like for people that are going to be working on the website? So a lot of nonprofits that work uh, with educational institutions will have student assistants. They're there for a semester, and then they're gone. Other nonprofits get a little bit of a break if they hire student interns during the summer, at least in Canada. Um, that means that every summer you have to train a new cohort of, of folks. Good to know right away. What is the breakdown of your funding sources, and what's the most important? Now, you're probably going to see that from their financial reports anyway, but it's a good thing to start the conversation so you can see, OK, um, they do a lot of fundraising drives. Are we going to have to build that into the website? Yes, no, maybe. Um, how, how complex is their donation system? Good to know. Another thing is, how often are they applying for uh, technology grants? Because those technology grant applications ask for a nice section about the technology that you're going to be using. And guess who's better than you to write that section? Nobody. So you can actually start helping them to get the money so they can pay you. <clears throat> Excuse me, so they can pay you. <laughs> Which is pretty awesome from both sides. It's a win-win. And finally, what third-party integrations are we going to be doing for this website? So nonprofits love to have many little tiny pieces of technology that they all have to piece into one website. Um, and that's a really big, big question. You need to know what kind of level of effort you are um, needing for this part. I'm going to have a quick little drink. I'm sorry. All right, so fun part, nonprofit technology. All right. So of course, there's an opportunity for non-devs. And for the duration of the talk, I'm going to go non-devs, devs, this is what you can do. Because in WordPress, we have this fancy thing called themes, right? So if you're working with theme customization, that's what you do. You can still do that and, and make a difference for smaller nonprofits, help them really get uh, up and running um, on, on the web. 
please keep the admin simple when you do this. You don't want their maybe first experience with WordPress to be a terrible one, and then they go away to Drupal or something like that. Um, you also just want to make it easy for people to use the products that you're creating, right? Yeah, I'm talking about page builders. Please, please don't use page builders. Um, thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. I actually did a talk last year about how much I hate page builders. <laughs> so this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. But what can you do without page builders? Well, most small nonprofits, they're not going to have the resources to work with their layout and all these options that the page builder gives. Give them a nice single column cost, uh, content well that they can plug things into as they need to, short codes, you're good to go. You really don't need page builders. Um, if you're a dev, you can make custom fields that are specific to the content that these folks are going to be putting on their website. You can make flexible content areas. What can you do for that uh, to do that? Advanced Custom Fields Pro is probably my favorite. As it turns out, it's pretty heavy on the load time, so we'll, we're going to see what happens there. Um, pods is another option. And of course, Gutenberg is coming out soon. Maybe? So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, I'm hoping that'll simplify the whole process a lot more. And like I mentioned, integration is the name of the game. So the first thing is, of course, MailChimp, right? Newsletter is the most uh, effective marketing tool out there. Nonprofits use them as well. Um, MailChimp is usually the one that they use. Pretty simple, right? Copy, paste your code, customize it, CSS on your site, you're good to go. If you're not quite comfortable with that, there are plugins for that, for example. Um, oh, what just happened? I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Oh, OK. All right. Was it just the screens in front or? OK, whatever. <laughs> Traffic analysis and visitor data. Of course, we want to track people who are coming to our website, how they're using it, how we can optimize it rinse and repeat. So Google Analytics, pretty, pretty simple integration there as well. Copy, paste, if that's not so much of your speed. I wouldn't recommend using a plugin that's specific to Google Analytics, because you can get so much more out of something a little bit more versatile. So let's say all in one SEO pack. I'm going to probably install it anyway. Go ahead and plug your property ID into a field that's there. Social media. Nonprofits also use social media. What do you know? So about 92% of nonprofits who responded to a specific survey um, use Facebook. 72% use Twitter. There's plenty of them on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn as well. The easiest thing to do, use those simple share URLs that are available from the different networks. Plug in your permalink, you're good to go, right? Twitter, you have a message, you have a permalink. LinkedIn, your permalink, you need an email button. All right, href mail to, done. Uh, you want to print the thing, a little bit of vanilla JavaScript, and you're good to go as well. If that's not so much of your speed, their social media share button um, plugins, usually they're a little heavy for what they're providing. So if you can manage to do this stuff, I would, I would highly recommend that you do. All righty, fun stuff, payments, donations, this is what nonprofits really need you to do on their website. Um, simple stuff you can do, PayPal. First of all, PayPal offers discounts on their, the fee that they do per, per transaction to registered nonprofits. So that's already a lovely thing. You can also create a simple donation button right in the PayPal um, account for your nonprofit. They give you copy paste code. You put it on your website, you style it, it to go. When people click on that button, they get taken to a page like this, where at the top you have the name of your nonprofit, and they say, OK, how much do you want to donate? This much. Awesome. Do you want to make it a recurring donation? Recurring donations are kind of the coolest thing. Because as we know from business, when you can ask for a small amount regularly, you're probably going to end up getting a bigger amount than if you ask for a large amount right away. Cool. You can also use Stripe. Stripe is a thing. Um, they have a really, really handy repo of PHP tutorials on how to set up your donations with Stripe. Um, there's a link. Um, and if that's not so much of your speed, there is a plugin for that, too. The plugin is actually pretty cool. 
Uh, it's very, very simple to use, and it gives you some great options. Fundraising plugins. This is the real fun. Now, my favorite is Give. Give is kind of like the, the everything you ever wanted in a fundraising plugin made by lovely folks. Uh, they give you the free plugin. The base is free. PayPal integration is free. If you want some fancy extra features, you're going to have to pay for it. That's fine. They also package it uh, into different bundles, so it makes it a little bit more affordable. Cool things they have are recurring donations, MailChimp integration, Google Analytics, so you can actually track the donations individually, Stripe Gateway, Zapier. Zapier we'll talk about in a moment as well. The special feature here is this built-in reporting module yeah, they have. So it's basically like having Google Analytics, but for your nonprofit donations. You can get an actual bird's eye view of whether or not your fundraising is working, what you have to adjust, rinse and repeat. Another option is charitable. And yeah, for these ones, for, for fundraising, I would not recommend that you go ahead and build it from scratch. Um, these are already existing. They're well-maintained. Why do that when this is a lot more um, financially? Uh, it makes sense, a lot more sense. So charitable. Similar idea, you have your free uh, base that comes with PayPal. You can add things uh, for additional fee. There's a cool extension called the Ambassadors extension, and it allows for peer-to-peer -peer campaigning, which is the hottest thing in fundraising right now. And what it allows you to do is, for example, I want to, I'm going to get married, and I say, you know what, instead of gifts, can you just all donate <clears throat> to my charity of choice? Awesome. I'm going to go to that charity's website. I'm going to create a page specifically for me and my campaign. And folks are going to come, come there and make their donations. So it means that the nonprofit actually doesn't have to go out and get all of those donors individually. They just got me to come and make the campaign. Really cool feature. Actually, as it turns out, this feature is also available through Give. Uh, they just put out a tutorial yesterday that uses Give, the free plugin, Caldera, free, and you can make this work on their platform, which is pretty awesome. Uh, there's also fundraising with WPMU Dev. If you have their membership, it makes sense to, to get this because it comes free with the membership. Um, but if you're just going to get it for the fundraising, there's, there's really no point. Um, you get a whole like, library of plugins, themes, backups, tutorials. If you don't need all that stuff, then you're better off with some other options. And of course, there's WooCommerce. Woo! No? OK. Uh, <laughs> WooCommerce, we all know, we love, right? It's free, it comes with PayPal, it's built by Automatic. Um, there are additional extensions that make this work. So there is recurring payments, subscriptions, MailChimp. You can name your price. Uh, all of these things you can get to make it work. So what does this look like, comparatively speaking? You can do some things for free. You can definitely get, get going with Give and Charitable for free. Uh, but if you're going to get their like, recommended package, that's what we're talking about. If you can see the WPMU dev is like, whoa, that's a bit much. But unlimited site licenses, so it depends on what your philosophy is about your clients owning every little piece of their website versus you are providing uh, various bits and pieces and you're maintaining the, um, the memberships. I usually go with, hey, can you please own everything? And if something happens to me, we're OK. Donor management. Uh, since we're taking donations, we're going to have to build relationships with our donors. That means that we're going to have to use a CRM or, or a contact relationship or client relationship management system. If you haven't used one, who's used a CRM? Oh, guys, you got to use CRMs. Just use it for your own business to see what it's like. It's amazing. You get to basically put your leads in a different uh, location from your mailbox and interact with them there so they don't get lost. Here, for donors, it means that you can do all of your donor communication in a separate area. Um, and it all allows you to do a whole slew of other things, things like Salesforce, HubSpot, Zoho CRM, those are the most used ones. Salsa is marketed specifically to nonprofits. Um, so that's the one you might be working with most often. Here's an opportunity for all of you WordPress plugin people. This is like the best one I could find, the best CRM. Um, 
for WordPress. All the other ones that claim to be CRMs, they really give you a very limited, limited set of functions. This one gives you the ability to set tasks per, um, per donor, per customer. But really, if, if you want to help this industry, take a look at what's available out there. Take a look at the actual CRMs and what they offer and see if you can replicate it uh, for the nonprofit community, specifically in WordPress. A few technical considerations when you're working with CRMs, because how are you integrating this with your website? Well, generally, you're going to capture some stuff from a form. right? It's going to be like a MailChimp thing. Hey, what's your name? What's your interest? Submit. On submit, that information goes into your CRM, and um, it's creating or updating a record that already exists. Sometimes it can be on the donation form as well. Those are kind of the two standard things. Technical considerations. All right, best case scenario, it's going to be a copy-paste. Yes. Otherwise, maybe an iframe. OK, not too bad. This is simple stuff, right? If that's not an option, you can search for a WordPress plugin that's already a connector. Again, those of you working in plugin development, there is so much stuff to be done in this area of nonprofit tech. Uh, worst case, or sorry, not worst case scenario. Next, if there isn't a WordPress plugin, go through Zapier. So Zapier is kind of like an if this, then that. Have we used if this, then that? OK. So there's a trigger, and then there's a reaction. The trigger comes from your website. Something is submitted. The reaction is we create a record in the CRM. We update that record. Um, pretty cool tool. And if you remember, Give has integration with Zapier. So woohoo. Um, worst case scenario? You might have to work with some APIs. And I'm not talking about REST API with WordPress. I'm talking about the, the API of the CRM that you're working with. They will have their own, which means you're going to have to probably dig through documentation. You should be comfortable digging through documentation anyways. Cool. As I mentioned, nonprofits like to have lots of little pieces of technology out there. And a lot of nonprofits that work with data, particularly those that work with uh, policy, for example, will have projects that they've done that have a lot of data that they might have put into an access database. So it, yeah, it definitely behooves you to, to at least know how to work with an access database or have someone on the team who knows how to work with it. You can bring it into WordPress if you want to, if that's OK with them, or keep it separate. But that is definitely a tech consideration to keep in mind. And of course, I can't not say anything about accessibility. There's two talks, I believe, after this in this track on accessibility. So if you don't know much or if you want to learn more, stick around. It's going to be definitely worth your time. There's an extra little level with nonprofits that comes to accessibility. And that's as soon as you're getting government funding, you can be required to adhere to a minimum level of accessibility for all the products that you create with that funding, which means that if you don't, you could have your funding cut or you could have to find, uh, pay a fine. Those are not things you want to deal with as a nonprofit or any organization. So it definitely behooves you to know at least a basic accessibility um, level type information. OK, so let's say that all of this is going a little bit much. You're like, uh, I don't know if I really want to specialize in working with nonprofits, but I still want to use my WordPress skills for something good. There's a really cool movement inside of the WordPress community called Do Action. It started in South Africa, and it's a ha charity hackathon. It's a one-day hackathon you can run um, to help local nonprofits. Uh, I think it's the third year they're doing it in South Africa. This year, we're taking it to Montreal. I'm actually organizing one there for October 14th this year. And um, if any of you are Canucks tuning in, okay. things are happening. We just opened uh, registration or applications for nonprofits. So if you know a nonprofit in the Montreal area that needs a website, send them to the doaction.org website, do action, no spaces. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all those places. Um, but really, the point here is, regardless of how you go from here, I do encourage you to figure out what it really means for you to use WordPress for good. For me, it was working with nonprofits. Maybe for you, it would be working with female-run organizations. Or maybe it's about working with companies that make environmentally conscious products. It could be whatever it is. But as long as you understand that those magical powers you have at, the, at your fingertips 
to build platforms, to uh, elevate people, to give people voices, and let them actually do uh, have, a, have a bigger impact, that comes with a responsibility. And I hope that after this talk, you feel a little more empowered to go ahead and use your powers for good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. That's, we do have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, if there's questions from the floor, um, the microphones are down to either side. I, uh, I have a little question. Yes. Well, yeah, it's kind of a question. Yes. And so you said there are four main things that a nonprofit will try and yes. do. Yes. I, I think I may have identified a fifth. Great. Way to ruin my talk. <laughs> it's adding. I'm building on the yes and. Yes, please. It's a yes and. So, uh, and so uh, quite a few uh, nonprofits these days are um, trying to motivate their membership and their supporters to join them in campaigns, not just to, <clears throat> not just to raise money, but petitions mm -hmm. is something that we're starting to see coming through yep. a few more times. That's kind of the programs that they're running, in my mind. So it's... The programs that they run, the things that they're yeah. going to email you about, like, hey, do this thing because it's, it really, it's related to our cause. Go, go sign a petition. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes I mean, we're seeing sort of patterns as well come through as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've worked with a nonprofit in the UK, and they're, but they're international, and they have got a pattern for how they can encourage people, so design patterns. So I think... Um, so it's just like to add to the mm -hmm. really good integrations and the technology you're talking mm -hmm. about as well. It's worth looking around if you if you well, it doesn't just apply to nonprofits actually. Most specialisations, if you're if you're engaging with a particular niche and in industry, they'll have technologies that they use. Oh yeah. But often they'll also have design patterns That's that true. they'll reuse as well, which yep. are well worth looking and at. And I for. didn't really mention a lot of design in this talk. Kind Could of do specifically because I feel like good design is good design. Right? Yeah. There's patterns, right? Yeah. There's um, being user centric, right? Yeah. Making sure that the, the client's goals are met through your design and kind oh. of applies across board. You know, you're so right. I I'm shouldn't sorry. even have read that. No, <laughs> I. I yes, sir. Question from the yes. floor. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Dino from Croatia. Hi, I'm uh, Sasha from Montreal. Hi. <laughs> That's pretty far away. Uh, well, my question. First question mm -hmm. would be, uh, I presume you're working with the nonprofits here in the European Union? In the EU, in the States, in Canada. Okay, great. Yes. So, what's the st your standpoint in regard to uh, GDPR reg regulation next year? Because your whole business is centered around collecting emails that go into databases and everything, and you use the information, and that information has to be secured. Right. So next year, that would be a big deal. So I'm just your standpoint, and what's the case with that? Well, I feel like when you're, you're most of the time, you're using a third-party system. So it's really up to them to make sure that everything is secure properly on their end. And you can do research to make sure that, that that's the case. That yeah, I never thought okay. Okay. <laughs> that way. I, <laughs> okay. Do you want to? Well, add? no. It, it, that is the thing that's come up for us as well. Um, as if, as developers, you can. There's stuff we we can access guidance and best practice, and uh, there are people like uh, Heather who's spoken already at the conference, yes. and there are resources that are available to us, such that we can. Um, we can highlight to our clients mm -hmm. the best practice and the approach to take. And now sometimes, you know, the clients are fully on top of this and they understand the constraints. Sometimes they may be unaware of it. That's our job, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and also, like, some international charities, mm -hmm. you can have wildly different <laughs> expectations yeah. in different areas. Um, if you've got a multiple countries that you're dealing with and one of those is Germany, that will be quite different to some of the others. Um, Germany and Mexico, I found, had really? quite different. One of them wanted everything, mother's maiden name and everything else. German's not so keen on that. What do you know? So, but it, yeah, I think we, we can do best practice yeah, as, I think as best developers. Practice and we can the help them. I guess those networks, those technology networks, are really good places to bring that expertise into, mm -hmm. into the community. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Great, thank you. My okay, uh, another question for the floor? Yes, over yes. there. 
Hi, I'm Laura from Paris. So, hey. Um, you said you, we should avoid build a page builder. Sorry? You said uh, we should avoid page builder. Page and builders, I, yes. I also against. <laughs> so, yes. uh, we can use SCF Pro, um, but these types of uh, organization want many templates of pages, uh, many flexibilities. And how can we give these flexibilities uh, without blowing the budget? So I think you're talking about having lots of different layout options without having to create templates for each one of them. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I mean, it's okay. a question like, yeah. Yeah. So page builders are like, how can we get lots of different things really cheaply? Right. Well, yeah. first, you can really work on that from the content, um, the information architecture standpoint, to make sure that everything kind of fits really neatly into where it should go on the website, one. Two, you can offer them, I think I mentioned, yeah, um, flexible content. So things like short codes and flexible content that, for example, comes with uh, advanced custom fields that you can actually plug into the body of your... Yes, but yeah. Uh, so that gives them flexibility, essentially. Yes, but uh, we must uh, make um, so many front development, so many times, so money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if it's just chunks, it's not a whole template that's completely unique, then the front end development is really limited. So you're offering flexibility, but you're also controlling that flexibility in a way that lets the client really focus on content and not worry about layout. That's, that's how we do it anyway. Does that okay. answer your question? Thanks, same thing. Yeah. OK, I think I suspect there'd be more to follow up. I wonder if we can maybe sort of get a little tribes thing around nonprofits sure. going. That would be if awesome. There's space in the day. If not, if not today, this work camp, or another work camp in the future, because the, the, the nonprofits either third sector it's kind of a approach. It's a huge community of nonprofit tech It is very large indeed. Actually, let's have a quick show of hands. Who here has got most of their business or like an appreciable part of their business is engaging with nonprofits? All right. That's good. OK. Sweet. Look around. Keep your hands in the air. OK. Look around. See who else has got their hands up in the air. These are your people. Yes. Find them. <laughs> find them in Houseman. Find them at the party tonight. Actually, find them at the party. Just have a, have a nonprofit dance Just off. Just That's them. the thing to do. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you to all of you and Thank your questions you. as well. We'll be back.